Okay. Yeah, so uh, like Professor Rost already told you, my name is Michael Bernhofer and today I'm presenting a transmembrane helix and protein prediction method called TMSEC. So um, like uh, Professor Rost just told you um, that last time you talked about transmembrane proteins and transmembrane helices, but the question is why um, do we need another predictor and if there are really still improvements possible or not. So what I did for my uh, method is I uh, so well oh, basically this is just the first slide. Here you can see that uh, TMSEC, which is my method, and compared to different other state-of-the-art transmembrane prediction methods like Polyphobius and MEMSAT. PhD HDM is a little bit older but just to show you that it's still not that bad, basically, uh, if you take into account the error bars, that it still holds up today. And the last one is just a baseline predictor, which takes the average hydrophobicity of a stretch of 21 amino acids, and at a given threshold, it just says, okay, these 21 amino acids, they are tra transmembrane helix. And as you can see, uh, all the methods, or at least all the state-of-the-art methods are within one standard error of the other method. So while TMSEC seems to improve over the other one on average, based on the small data set that I had for the validation, you can't uh, say that it's significantly better. Though in some aspects, which I will talk about later, it's really, uh, even with the error bar, it's still significantly better. So, this is just the header of uh, the paper, if you want to look it up. It's not too long, only if, uh, six pages, something like that, and uh, if you want to really go into the details of the method. So, why do we need yet another one? First thing is, many of the methods I showed you are several years old. So, at the moment, you'd expect that we have more data available, and in theory, you could just use the old algorithms and methods and retrain them on the new data sets. But unfortunately, almost nobody does that. So they published the methods up to maybe 10 years ago and then never retrained it. Yeah? Can you say why? It's not unfortunate. There's a reason for that. What? That they don't retrain it? Yeah. Well, I'm. Um, Let's see whether your programs will be available in 10 years from now. I hope so. <laughs> okay. Uh, the other thing is uh, that, well, the machine learning over time nowadays, it's not that extensive. The algorithms got better, they got faster, more efficient, and also nowadays we have more computing power. So you can uh, make more complex algorithms as you could a few years ago. And the other thing is the runtime of those methods. For example, MEMSAT takes around five minutes per protein. And if you want to predict, say, the human proteome, you have 20,000 proteins. So you can do the math on how long it takes you to predict all of them. OK, so first step in designing a new algorithm, you need a data set. We want to predict transmembrane proteins and transmembrane helices. So first thing was I assembled a data set of membrane protein sequences. I took the sequences from OPM and PDBTM, which are two manually created um, protein databases of 3D structures taken from PDB. I think you're familiar with PDB, it's protein database. And uh, then they applied an uh, algorithm themselves. So most of those uh, structures aren't um, experimentally defined where the transmembrane helices are. So experimentally they are defined as transmembrane proteins, but the exact position of the helices isn't always uh, that easy to allocate. And they have their algorithms themselves and try to figure out where to annotate the transmembrane helices. Um, you can also see that those algorithms don't always agree because between OPM and PDBTM 
we have different annotations for the same three-dimensional structure. Sometimes just a few residues, sometimes they don't even agree on the number of transmembrane helices per protein. The other thing is PDB often has only fragments of those sequences, so I had to map them to the uniprot sequences to get the whole protein sequence to train on. For this I have used another database called SIFTS, which is a database that holds many different IDs for the same sequence in different databases. So it's not only usable for OPM and PDBTM, but you can use it for PDB, SwissProt, Tremble, uh, basically all your different protein databases, SIFT most likely has a mapping for the at least most popular protein databases. And the other thing is I had uh, to reduce the redundancy in my data set because the original data set of transmembrane proteins that I could extract from those two databases were around 1000. But Many of those proteins were just uh, resolved multiple times in PDB. So for one sequence I had maybe 10 structures which only differed in the resolution and uh, thus after reducing it uh, with unique prod, another tool that can be used to filter out similar proteins, I was left with only 166 transmembrane proteins. Yes? <coughs> Say redundancy reduction, do you mean that you excluded like completely identical things or to some extent? Um, so that's the thing, thing with this H value. Um, did you already show them the HS? Okay. So do you remember the HSSP curve with the midnight? That's more. Ah, thanks. <laughs> yeah, my first lecture. So, <laughs> okay. So, uh, where you basically have on one axis the percentage sequence identity of an alignment, and here you have the length of the alignment. And then the HSP curve just goes down like this. And uh, so basically for every protein pair that has an H value above zero, so the typical curve is H value zero, everything above it, we could infer that they have the same structure. Everything below, we don't know. And so basically what I did, I only have pairs below this curve. Everything else I excluded. Okay. So this is an example from OPM because other than the transmembrane helices in a protein I also needed to know the orientation of the protein. So basically which side is on the cytoplasm and which side is extracellular for example. PDBTM unfortunately when I started uh, producing this method didn't have those annotations but OPM did. So this was the other thing that I had to do. I took the inside-outside topology for the proteins from OPM and also mapped it to PDP uh, TM. And this was another uh, case where they don't really agree because uh, sometimes when I try to map it the membrane layer due to, for example, missing transmembrane helices or just mis uh, different boundaries, I would uh, have a transmembrane helix that has cytoplasmic side on both sides. So this was another thing where I had to manually look at the structure and to my best knowledge try to determine what is inside, what is outside. Okay, so now we have our positive data set of transmembrane proteins, now we need our negative data set. This I derived from the data set which was used to uh, make signal P, which is a signal peptide prediction method. And uh, it had thousands of sequences, but uh, once again I had to look at the redundancy for one in the signal P data set and for one uh, redundancy compared to my 166 transmembrane proteins. So the first thing that I did is I didn't want to lose any more transmembrane proteins so I threw out everything in the signal P data set that was similar, similar in the case of uh, H value above zero to my 166 transmembrane proteins 
remove them. And then for the remaining proteins from the signal P data set, once again, I did uh, redundancy reduction and threw out those pairs. Um, what I was left with was uh, 1,100 roughly soluble proteins and also 300 membrane proteins. Because the signal P dataset doesn't uh, only include soluble proteins, they also have membrane proteins. But for most of them, they didn't have experimental annotations. So I used them for the categorization in transmembrane and non-transmembrane proteins, but I didn't use them later on when I tried to really predict where the transmembrane helices were. So my data set, finally completed. I have 166 experimentally uh, defined transmembrane proteins, roughly 1,400 in the signal P data set. And I want to make my method. So thing is, I can just train on all of them because then I have nothing left for the validation. Uh, so I have to remove some in this case 25% for my blind test set at the end and the remaining 75% are used in a threefold cross-validation to optimize my parameters for the different machine learning tools. In the future, this uh, validation set for the end uh, validation is called the blind, yes? Uh, were there like two separate experiments for those two data sets or they were somehow? Um, no, so uh, the 75 and the 25 percent split, I combined them in the team. Ah, no. I mean for TMP and SP, did you do like separate prediction and then compare the results? Or did you like uh, No, so uh, basically um, the blind test split, I combined them into one data set. Can you repeat the question for the right? Okay, so uh, the question was if I made two different methods to train on this and train on this data set. Or if I combine them, and what I did, I combined them into one data set of positive and negative uh, samples for transmembrane and non-transmembrane proteins. Okay, so uh, first, uh, before we go into the details of TMSEC, I guess you're all familiar with neural networks, but uh, maybe classification trees and random forests, which are used, are not that well known. So a uh, quick introduction to classification trees. Um, basically you have number of n training samples that you give into the tree and you have m features that you're using, for example, amino acid composition, hydrophobicity, stuff like that. And then the uh, tree tries at each node to get one of those features and a threshold for this feature where it can best split the data set. To have a better view of this, we have a well, imaginary data set and we want to separate it. So what the classification tree first tries, okay, it looks at the feature X2, tries to find a good split value to separate the data set. This is around uh, uh, 0 0.7 where you can see that, okay, you have most of the ones above it, most of the threes are below. The twos are a little bit in between. But at the first split, it looks like X2, splits it at uh, 0 0.7. Then in each of the child nodes, it once again tries to find the best feature that it can use to split up the data set. This time it uses X1 at two different thresholds and the leaf nodes of the tree then determine what is the majority class in those data set splits. So it's still uh, possible that the classes are a little bit intermixed. For example, on the uh, leaf which says three, you still have some twos and ones, but the majority class is three. So the prediction would be class three. And what a random forest does is it builds just many of those trees. And uh, at the end for the prediction, so it, uh, if you have a new sample that you want to predict, it runs it through all of the trees. And the class that is predicted most of the time is then the final prediction for the random forest. Of course, if you would build every tree on the whole data set, then every tree would just look the same. And uh, for this a random forest, it uses random trees, which basically just means out of all the features that you have, it uses a certain subset. 
of features which at every split is determined randomly thus random tree and you can also uh, say that instead of the full data set it only uses a subset of the samples so maybe 90% only of the samples and this way you get many different trees but each tree is optimized to separate its data set uh, on the features that it got and uh, this way a random forest is very robust uh, if it's um, for example, it's very robust against overtraining because it doesn't always use the full sets of features and it doesn't always use the full set of samples. And uh, in recent times, random forests gained popularity. So, in addition to the popular, uh, really popular neural networks, and uh, also in recent time, the support vector machines, uh, you can see that the random forest here right at the end <laughs> go up. <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't have more recent statistics. So this is from, I think, last year or 2015. Okay, so now to TeamSec. Um, basically, TeamSec is uh, divided into four separate steps for the protein prediction and the first step is using a random forest. In my case I've used 100 trees and the M is the number of random features that is selected for each classification. As you can see later on we have much more than only nine features so that's only a small subset of the features that we have. And in the end I get three different classes, signal peptides, transmembrane helices and basically the rest are soluble residues. Yes? So could you please briefly remind what signal peptides? Because I presume it was in the last lecture. Oh, you, you, oh okay. Okay, uh, then just a quick introduction to signal peptides. So signal peptides are basically short stretches most of the time at the start of the protein but there are some rare cases where it might be somewhere in the middle of the sequence or even at the end. And a signal peptide is used to determine where the protein should be transported to. So most of the time, for example, for secreted proteins, uh, the signal peptide uh, is used to get the protein out of the cell. So basically like a address where the protein should go after it's, it's uh, expressed. Yeah, it's part of the protein, but uh, oftentimes it's cleaved. So there are also signal anchors, which are not always cleaved, but signal peptides most of the time are cleaved. And uh, the difficulty for signal peptides is that they have a stretch of maybe 10 or even longer of highly hydrophobic residues. And they have also a part of positively charged residues. I will tell you later why the positive charge is also a problem. But uh, the stretch of hydrophobic residues basically causes uh, signal peptides to often be confused for transmembrane helices and the other way around. And recent methods started to not only predict transmembrane helices but also signal peptides to better distinguish between those two cases. Okay, is it more clear now what signal peptides are and why it's important to predict them? And uh, yeah, so in the future when I'm talking about scores, it's just basically the probability that I get from the random forest multiplied by 1000. And uh, I did this internally to just increase the uh, speed of the algorithm because then I could use integers instead of doubles. But that's only a minor detail. So the other thing is um, from, I think also the previous lecture, you should be familiar with the sliding window approach for the prediction of secondary structure. I did the same in this step. I have a window size of 19 residues. The size is mainly chosen because of the typical length of transmembrane helices and also with uh, yeah, minor parameter optimization during the training and 19 residues turned out to be the best size. And what the random forest predicts is basically just those scores. 
This is just an example of a protein, so it's imaginary. It doesn't uh, have a real sequence. And uh, basically what you can see in this example, okay, at the start I would probably predict a signal peptide. And then I have, well, it seems like two transmembrane helixes, but one is really large and you will see that uh, these cases we will try to split into two if it's really too long. Okay, so we talked about features for the random forest. What are we using for this first prediction? We have the global amino acid composition of the protein and uh, the protein length. Though the protein length isn't uh, the absolute number, but it's been if it's longer than 120, 240 and such. So because using the exact length, then you have too many different lengths and this might confuse the machine learning algorithm. We are also using uh, the PSSM score. I will go into detail what the PSSM score is in the next slide. The distance to the N and C terminus of the protein so that we have a rough sketch on where we are in the protein. Again, it's not the absolute number, but bind. We have the average hydrophobicity. We have the percentage of hydrophobic residues, of positively and negative charge residues, and of polar residues. And for those physical chemical properties, so the last four, I reduced the window size to only nine residues, so we have a more local feature and not with the 19 residues where it might just yeah, dilute the picture because we have a too long stretch and if you build the average, then it might not be any, uh, meaningful anymore. Okay, so the PSSM. It's short for position specific scoring matrix and it's used uh, or it's generated by Psyblast. Have you heard of Psyblast before? And basically why are we using the PSSM? Well, as you certainly heard multiple times before, homology information, so information of, from related proteins is one of uh, the most important feature I would say if you want to increase your prediction performance. Because then you have just, well, basically many more sequences to use for the training, even if it's just compiled into this PSSM score. And uh, what you can see is on the left side, in the uh, second column, that's just the sequence of the query protein. In this case, it's cut off after the fifth residue, but it's much longer. And uh, for every position, you have a specific score in the matrix for every other amino acid. And uh, the score basically tells you, based on the background distribution in the data set, is a substitution to this amino acid more or less likely than you would expect just by random chance uh, based on the distribution in the data set. So in this case, if you have a positive score, then it's more likely. If you have a negative score, it's less likely. Or if you have a zero, then it's basically just by random. Is this thing built from like, something like Lawson 62 or like um, it's similar, so basically BLAST and also PSYBLAST in the first step to build the local alignments, it's using BLOSSOM, but for every, uh, so PSYBLAST basically has multiple iterations. First iteration it uses the BLOSSOM matrix and for every further iteration it uses this PSSM and after every iteration it uh, readjusts the PSSM scores based on new sequences it found. But it basically is uh, comparable to a blossom matrix, at least uh, from the scores. Okay, but how do we use those PSSM scores? Well, for the random forest, it's simple. Uh, for the window size of 19, we just have 20 times 19 features. So for every position, of those 19 residues in the window, we have 20 features, each signifying the PSSM scores for a substitution to a different amino acid. But for example, if we want to use the PSSM scores for the average hydrophobicity or for the amino acid composition, 
it's not uh, well that simple that you can just use the scores. And what I did is, okay, I first divided them into positive and negative scores. Zeros are included, but zeros aren't that often. And then I looked at, uh, for example, for the amino acid um, composition, how many positive scores do I have in total in this matrix for my window size of 19 and how many negative scores do I have? In this case, I have 16 positive and 79 negative scores. Then for the amino acid composition of M in this stretch, so for this example, I'm using only the first five residues. How many positive M's do I have? So I look into the column for M. How many positives do I have? Only one. I had 16 positive scores in total, so I say, okay, my positive amino acid composition for M is 1 16th. The opposite for the negative amino acid composition, we have three negative scores in the M column for this stretch, so it's three divided by 79. Similar, for example, for the percentage of positive charge residues, you have to know which are positive charge, so R and K column. We have only two uh, positions where those have a positive score. We have eight positions where they have a negative score. So once again, we have two sixteenth and eight seventy-nine. So what do we have in total? Well, we have the positive and the negative global amino acid composition. So those are forty features. We have the bin protein length, that's one additional one. We have the PSSM scores for the window size of 19, so 29 by 19. Why 29? Because at the start and the end of the sequence, I have to introduce a imaginary 21st uh, residue that just signifies, okay, here I don't have a sequence, because it's at the start or at the end. Then I have two features for the distance to the N and C terminus. I have two for the average hydrophobicity, once again, the positive and negative PSSM scores for the percentage of hydrophobic, for the percentage of ch positive and negative charge, and for the percentage of polar. So in total, 452 features. And like I said, for the random trees, we are only using nine at each split. So, Okay, then after the first prediction, I have three scores for every residue in the protein, which tells me if the random forest believes it to be a signal peptide residue, a transmembrane uh, residue, or a non-membrane residue. After that, I run a medium, a median filter over the whole scores, uh, just to filter out, for example, if I have only one position in between two stretches of residues that are predicted as transmembrane and have one soluble, then the median filter just filters out this uh, gap because most of the time it's just an outlier in the prediction. The other thing is the data set is pretty heavily biased towards soluble residues and compared to signal peptide residues it's also a little bit biased towards transmembrane residues. And to balance out this overprediction of soluble uh, residues, I adjusted the scores for soluble and for transmembrane prediction by 185 and by 60 respectively, which if you uh, remember, I multiplied the percentage by 1000. So it's basically I reduced uh, soluble by 18.5% and transmembrane by 6%. And after I filtered the scores, adjusted the scores, then I'm assigning each residue to the highest score. Okay, now I have a prediction. There are some things that are just not really meaningful in the biological sense. So for example, signal peptides with less than four residues, I throw out and I say, okay, it's soluble. Same is true for transmembrane helices in this step, which are less than seven residues. Eight residues or seven residues are still quite short for transmembrane helices, but in a later step I have uh, the option that I might uh, make them longer or combine two short ones. So for now I leave them in. 
Um, then just to illustrate how this median filter works. Yes? Just before you press the, uh, I'd like to understand that the word n is just that my data set is n, right? So n is not quite the number of proteins, right? It's the number of positions of the, of the sliding windows in each protein. Exactly. So in this case, n would be the number of proteins times the number of residues they have. So basically, oh. all the residues I have in all the proteins. And so you're using the H ones as well by employing this no residue. Exactly. Okay. So this is just an example for median filter. Um, not to confuse it with mean, because I think most often people are trying to make the mean or the average. In this case, I've used the median because uh, it's much better at filtering out single outliers. And in this example, we're looking at the five residues from P to P, once again. The red ones uh, are just to signify where we're looking at, so those five residues. And the uh, green, the 600, is the median of those five scores. So the central residue, we have a window size of five for the median filter, is then assigned to the median value, so in this case 600. And uh, after that I have the adjustment for my over predictions, so I have final scores, which can be negative, but as I'm just comparing which one has the highest, it's not really a matter if it's below or above zero. And uh, then I have my prediction. In this case, I'm predicting a stretch of signal peptide. So is it uh, clear how a median filter function uh, works? Or should I go into more detail? Uh, I mean, so what the median is, uh, everybody knows. Okay. <laughs> okay, so now we have the first two steps of TMSEC completed. We're going from this rough sketch of scores to our prediction. And in this case, we predict a signal peptide at the start, a shorter transmembrane helix, and a very long transmembrane helix. Okay, now the f uh, third step in the uh, TMSEC prediction algorithm uh, tries to. Uh, yeah, sorry. Can you maybe explain again how you get to the probability scores from your tree model? And because you showed binary, uh, like absolute labels, but if you get probabilities, it must be something. Ah, okay. So um, the probability scores. Uh, so basically, we're going. Back to this one. Okay, so uh, one thing is that, for example, uh, on the leaf node for three, I might not really just have, okay, 100% for three, 0% for the rest, but I have this uh, split. So I ha have a split based on how many instances do I classify. So this is the first kind of probability that I can get. And in the random forest, I have many such trees. And then it's the average of all the probabilities from all the trees. And this way I get a probability and not just one zero zero, for example. Okay. Okay, so in the uh, third step, we're trying to refine this first prediction. Oh, um, by the way, so now in the third step, we are sure which is a transmembrane protein and which is not. Basically, everything that still has a prediction for transmembrane helix is considered a transmembrane protein. Everything else is considered a soluble one. Okay. The prediction means like majority of the amino acids are classified like transmembrane? Uh, no. Uh, if I have at least one stretch of seven or more transmembrane residues, then I say this is a transmembrane protein. This one? So this score, that's the score, this what you call probability? Uh, yeah, so it's the probability times 1,000. So if we... Can you explain the axis and what you show? Ah, okay, good. Um, so the y-axis in this in case, the score, this is, like I said, uh, 1,000 times the output from the random forest, which is uh, 
a probability. So if I have 1000 as a score, then uh, the random forest set probability of 1 or 100%. And the x axis is uh, just the position in the protein that is predicted. Okay. Okay, so uh, now comes something new, basically, which I tried uh, for Team Sec. Oftentimes you have some kind of dynamic programming to get the best stretches of transmembrane helices based on the scores that you predict in the first step. Or you might uh, make a second predictor that uses the output of the first and tries to refine it uh, based on the residues. What I tried was not working on residues anymore, but on segments. So first thing is segments can have a variable length can be 8 residues, it can be 30, it can be somewhere in between. And uh, thus I can no longer use the window approach. And I also have a problem that I can't use position specific uh, features because if I have a stretch of 8 amino acids and if I have a straight, uh, stretch of 15 amino acids, then if I want to have a fixed feature vector, I would have to decide, okay, I take the longest segment that I can have, and for shorter segments, I would have to leave out many positions in the feature vector, because I just don't have that. So what I did, I only used non-position specific features. For example, I used the amino acid composition of this uh, segment. I used the average hydrophobicity, because for transmembrane helices, that's always basically the first feature you want to have. I used, once again, the percentage of hydrophobic and of charged residues. And, of course, in this case, the segment length. But this time, I used the exact segment length, because now we're not having differences of maybe 17 residues and 3,000 residues, which you can have for proteins, but we have a more well, evenly distributed set of length. So I have in total this time 47 features only. Um, instead of using a random forest, this time a neural network worked just the best. So during the optimization in the cross-validation, cross-training, I tried random forests at first because they worked perfectly for the first step, but for uh, this step, neural network just performed better. I use 25 hidden nodes. I guess you're familiar enough with neural networks that I don't have to explain them to you. Or should we make a short introduction to neural networks once again? Okay. <laughs> so, okay, now I have uh, those features. I can uh, basically take any segment as an input to the neural network and I get an output. My output basically is just binary. Is it a transmembrane helix or is it not? What I'm doing with this neural network is I'm looking at all the transmembrane segments that I have left after the first two steps of the prediction and I'm trying to adjust them. So I'm trying to maybe shift them a little bit uh, to the left or to the right, make them a little bit longer or shorter. But uh, in total, I'm only deviating the endpoints by up to three residues. If I would allow a much higher number, then I would have so many samples per transmembrane segment that it would increase the runtime and it would also increase the probability that I get maybe an outlier in the prediction, which would then completely uh, negate my, or well, invalidate my prediction of the transmembrane helix. The other thing that I'm trying is if I have one of those super long transmembrane helices, in my case I defined it as longer uh, or equal to 35 residues, which is long enough to span the typical membrane twice. I look at uh, all possible splits of uh, those uh, segments which uh, can be split into at least two, uh, into two transmembrane helices with at least 17 residues and a gap of one. That's the minimum case. If I have a stretch of 40 residues that I try to split, then I have more combinations with varying gap sizes and helix length. 
when you're saying I'm looking at different positions, do you mean that you cut in different ways and put the result in your data set back, or you're picking the right cut? That was the next thing I wanted to say. So it's. Ah, okay, so the question was uh, when I'm looking at those different segments, uh, if I put, uh, so for example, for every portion of the segment, if I put this back into the data set or not. Or, yeah, if I cut it and put it back. But uh, basically, what I'm doing is um, whenever I'm looking at one predicted uh, transmembrane segment uh, from the first two steps, I'm trying every possibility. I'm just uh, remembering the new segment basically that I tried and the score and whichever of those permutation has the highest score that is then the new annotation for this transmembrane segment. So I'm trying to optimize the score that I'm getting out of the neural network. The same is for uh, splitting long helixes. In this case um, uh, if I find a combination of two tr separate transmembrane helices which have a higher average score than the original long one then I'm taking the, uh, those two. And this uh, procedure of first splitting long helices, then adjusting the endpoints uh, is repeated several times if there is a change. So first I'm trying to split long ones, then I'm adjusting the endpoints. Then once again I'm uh, looking, maybe I have still some long ones which I now have a little bit readjusted in the position. Maybe now I can split them into two. And uh, if at some point I can't do anything of those, then I'm stopping. Or after five iterations, if there would just be no natural stop to it. Okay, so after the third step, we have refined our prediction and now we have one transmembrane helix which is a little bit shorter, uh, longer, sorry, and the long one we have split into two. And uh, this is our final prediction for the segmentation of the protein. So we have our signal peptides and we have our three transmembrane helices. The last step is now to predict the inside-outside topology. So which of the non-membrane loops is cytosolic and which is extracellular. Last time you heard about the positive inside rule, which basic... Could you quickly explain again how you decide where to split these um, pieces? Okay, so it's... Um, okay, so uh, the question was how I decide where to split the helix. That's, uh, like I said, so this helix, let's say it's 40 residues long. Does it fit? No, it's even longer. It's 60 residues long. And uh, then I'm trying every possible combination of two transmembrane helices, which are at least 17 residues, and have a gap between them of at least one residue that fit into this 60 amino acid stretch. And if I find a combination that has a higher average score from a neural network than the original 60 residues uh, transmembrane helix, then I'm splitting it. If I could, couldn't find a combination, then I would uh, leave the old one in. But uh, neural network needs training, right? Yes. So when you're saying I'm like checking the scores, you mean checking the scores that train network outputs? And if yes, then what do you train the network? Uh, okay, oh, yeah, sorry, I forgot to say. Um, the network, so the neural network is trained on... Okay, so question was, what did I train the network on? Because now I'm talking about predictions from the neural network, but how did I train it? Um, so for the training, I only use the transmembrane proteins because, like as I previously said, at this step, we already decide if a protein is transmembrane or not. So for the training, I also only use transmembrane proteins and as input for those segments, I used the soluble and transmembrane helix segments that I have uh, annotated in my structures, which I got from OPM and PDBTM. In addition, because I have more soluble uh, segments in those uh, proteins than I have transmembrane segments, I also introduced uh, permutations of the segments. So, for example, I'm taking a real transmembrane helix that is annotated in the structure and I'm just extending it by one residue at the end. So I have a little bit of noise, but 
one residue off is still good enough for a final prediction and this way I can uh, increase my training set and on these real and permutated segments I'm training uh, the neural network on. Okay. Okay, so the last step, the fourth step, is the topology prediction. This is once again a random forest. And now I'm not using so many fancy uh, features anymore. I'm just using the amino acid composition, the percentage of charge residues and the absolute difference of uh, charges on side one and side two. So what do we mean by side one and side two? I have my prediction of the protein and then just uh, I'm taking the first soluble segment and I say okay this, this is side one. After each transmembrane helix I'm crossing the membrane. So second segment side two, third segment side one again, last segment side two. This way I'm partitioning my sequence into side one and side two and for those I'm compiling those features. But I'm not only using um, the soluble segments, I also give a little bit of leeway and uh, I'm basically considering uh, up to eight residues into the transmembrane helix. I could just be a few residues off of, uh, with my prediction. So maybe inside of the helix are few of those positive charged residues that I want to find because positive inside rule where do I find the most positive residues is most likely the inside or the cytosolic side of the transmembrane protein. And I'm also only considering up to 15 residues um, outside of the transmembrane helix. This is uh, to avoid, for example, if you have a transmembrane protein that has transmembrane helix and then you have a large portion of the protein which is a soluble domain. I don't know, you have 300 residues in your domain and then you have transmembrane helix once again. So you have one soluble loop, so to speak, or segment with 300 residues and maybe on side two you have only a few residues, maybe, I don't know, 20. Then the likelihood that you have more positive charged residues on those 300 than on the 20 uh, is just too high, so I'm only considering the residues close to the transmembrane helix. Okay, so and from this I'm just predicting the N-terminal residue, so the first residue in the sequence, and once again extrapolating the topology, so if I predict the first uh, soluble se uh, segment to be inside, then after each transmembrane helix I'm switching sides. And one exception is if I predict a signal peptide in the protein, then I'm leaving this step out and I'm just saying everything after the signal peptide is outside. That's basically true for almost every protein that has a signal peptide. Okay, so now we are through the TMSEC algorithm and it's four steps. And we have our final prediction for our transmembrane protein. The signal peptide is most likely cleaved. And uh, this is what we would predict as the orientation of this protein in the membrane. So, next thing. We have our method. It gives me a prediction. But how good are we? So, one thing we could use is a per, sec uh, per residue measurement. So, for every residue, we have three classes. How many residues did we get correctly? Can work for some problems, but in this case, it's often misleading because uh, if we have a stretch of 19 transmembrane residues, 18 of those we predict as transmembrane, but one in the middle we predict as soluble, then we still predict the majority of them correctly and we would have a high accuracy, but the prediction itself would be meaningless because now we split one transmembrane helix into two, which might not even be long enough to cross the membrane. It would screw up our topology prediction because we would switch sides after the small gap. So, for transmembrane helix prediction, a per residue score isn't really good. So what we did was um, 
for whole proteins. And we have this QOK and QTOP score, which basically just means um, for the QOK, if I have predicted every single uh, transmembrane segment in the protein correctly, then uh, I add it up for the QOK. So QOK of 60% means for 60% of my transmembrane proteins, I have all of its transmembrane segments predicted correctly. Other things that we could use um, for the transmembrane helixes are, for example, recall and precision. So recall is basically how many of the transmembrane helixes did I predict? And uh, precision is how many of the transmembrane helixes that I predicted are correct. Yes? What does correct prediction mean? That's on the next. <laughs> okay, so uh, what does a correct prediction for transmembrane helix mean? Well, uh, earlier, in the publications, they just used an overlap of maybe three or five residues. So you could have two transmembrane uh, segments that are just overlapping by three residues, but you have, I don't know, 20 residues uh, for each of the segments, which are not overlapping. Which isn't really meaningful either. So what we tried is, okay, we're saying the endpoints of the observed and the predicted transmembrane helix may not deviate by more than five residues. So we still have a little bit of leeway for the prediction, but we have much less leeway than just a simple small overlap. The other thing is uh, we forced an overlap of the two segments of at least 50% of the shorter one. So, uh, no, no, sorry, of the longer one. Um, and this just prevents uh, for small segments uh, that this deviation of up to five residues becomes, uh, well, basically almost bigger than if we force this 50% overlap. If a short uh, transmembrane segment is still meaningful is another thing, but it might just be that we underpredicted the segment. So it might be 19 residues long, we predicted it to be 12. So it's still kind of correct, but an expert would see, okay, it's a little bit short. Maybe he then looks at the structure or looks at the amino acid um, properties and then can determine in which way to elongate it. Okay, so this is our definition for a correct one. Yes. The endpoint deviation. Um, so what I mean by endpoint deviation is that the start of the observed, which is H1, and yeah, so, so uh, the start position I of H1, which is the true and observed transmembrane helix, and the start uh, position A of H2, which is our prediction, may not deviate by f more than five residues. And the same uh, has to be true for the endpoint. So we don't sum up the deviation, so the start and the end can each deviate by up to five residues, but that's still a better criterion than just a small overlap. Then further for the topology, well, topology is more or less binary. In this case, I looked at the N-terminal topology, if I predicted correctly or not. And we also have the Q-top, which is uh, similar to the QOK, but an additional criteria is that the overall topology prediction has to be correct. So not just the placement of the transmembrane helices, but also inside outside topology. Okay, so how good are we? And how good are we compared to the other state-of-the-art algorithms? As you can see, TMSEC, at least on average, is the best one. But if you also look at the, oh, sorry, if you also look at the error bars, with maybe the exception here of Polyphobius, and well, over here Polyphobius is way below it, uh, we can't significantly say that it's better. We have this trend, but they are still within one standard error of the other methods. So it's unfortunate, but I only have 40 transmembrane proteins to make the statistic. 
and due to the small data set size we have such a high error margin. Okay, so this was basically how good are we with transmembrane segments or transmembrane helices. The other thing is how good are we in distinguishing soluble proteins from transmembrane proteins. For this uh, we have sensitivity which is basically just another word for recall and the false positive rate which uh, says okay how many of the soluble proteins do we predict as transmembrane proteins so the in, uh, or false positive prediction basically. and uh, we not only compared it to the other state of the art methods but only uh, also to this um, baseline predictor that we invented okay this time we have a little bit of better performance and also a significantly better performance on the false positive rate compared to the other because this time we're out of the first standard error compared to the other methods. On the transmembrane protein sensitivity unfortunately we are still within the standard error but as you can see basically every method at least got all of the transmembrane proteins. But especially uh, of, from the state-of-the-art methods MEMSAT has a very high false positive rate. And to put this into numbers, if we want to classify the whole human proteome, based on these error uh, rates, we would estimate that around 560 proteins are misclassified out of roughly 20,000. If you compare it to the probably second best method, Polyphobius, it has 200 more than TMSEC. So it's still good, but for example for MEMSAT and MEMSAT SVM you can really see the, uh, these high false positive rates make a huge difference. Thing is, human proteome has roughly an estimated 24% of transmembrane proteins, so 76% of them are soluble and uh, thus this false positive rate has such a huge impact. Well, the worst one is the baseline, but that's really a simple program you can write in, I guess, 20 minutes and it's not that sophisticated. But at least on the sensitivity, it's still high. And if you compare the false positive rate with MEMSAT, they aren't that different. <laughs> Where the huge difference at least is uh, for uh, TMSEC and here MEMSAT 3 is quite good, is the topology prediction. So how often do they at least get the topology right? They might predict a soluble protein as a transmembrane protein, but if it's really a transmembrane protein, how often is the topology uh, correct? And for this, TMSEC and MEMSAT are the best. And it's also one of the reasons why I included not only MEMSAT SVM, but also MEMSAT 3, because from previous evaluations, I could already see MEMSAT 3 is at least very good in topology prediction. And as I'm predicting, transmembrane proteins, the helices and the topology, I wanted to use it to compare my re uh, results to it. Yes. Can you please go back to the chart? To, yeah, to this one. Okay. So your results and how you measure the occurrence is quite clearly clarified this. But the other columns, are these the results from the papers or are this something that you've computed using your five deviation and 50% so of same parameters? Exactly. It's the same parameters. It's the same test set. Oh, sorry, okay. <laughs> Question was um, where the, uh, the other numbers co are coming from for the other methods. So if I'm just using the numbers from the papers or if I computed them myself and answer is I computed them myself. I used the same criteria for a correct prediction and I used the same test set. Um, there is the other thing then that TMSEC during training ne has never seen this test set. But for example, the other methods might have trained on proteins out of this test set or on at least similar ones. So we could say that the performance might be an overestimation, but it's, uh, well, always trying to argue, okay, they could have seen most of those proteins, uh, uh, thus they are better. But in the optimal case, every method has a very good generalization, so even on the training set, it shouldn't achieve 100%. Okay. 
the, the yeah, I'm just curious. So, okay. out of your experience of you know, applying machine learning to protein prediction problems, so in the machine learning, for example, like deep learning or whatever, they have benchmark data sets. Right, this images data set with 60,000 mm -hmm. training sets, 10,000 test sets. And everybody uses the same training testing set separation, so there is no such problem that those algorithms have seen that test samples. And so I, I'm curious why there is no such thing in um, well, the thing is that, okay, so um, the thing is, uh, the question is about the data sets. Why different algorithms have different data sets that they trained on? Why don't we just have one universal data set uh, where e uh, everybody uses the same splits? So basically everybody trains on the same data and predicts the same. Easy answer, we have quite a high growth of data. So why not use uh, maybe if you have double the data one year later or two years later, why not use it? That's the simple answer. Yeah, but given this answer, it means that those things haven't seen the new ones. Well, they might not have seen exactly those proteins, but they might have seen a protein that has 90% sequence identity. Right. But something uh, in the case of transmembrane proteins, or yeah, we were finished with. So um, I spent quite a, a lot of time on developing the method, then writing up the publication, and uh, almost three years later, I thought, okay, why not see? Do we have new data uh, that probably none of the methods and my method too hasn't seen before. Well, it turns out after those three years, we only have 12 new transmembrane proteins which are distinct from uh, the training set that I used. So we did make a prediction uh, on those. We uh, compared the performance to the other methods, but on a data set of only 12 proteins, it's hard to say that the results are really significantly different. At least I can say uh, out of those 12, well, 10 were predicted completely correct with TMSEC. But the other methods, they had similar results. But the thing is, if they only predict, for example, nine out of those 12, you have a shift by uh, almost nine percentage points. So <laughs> one protein makes a huge difference on this data set. Okay, the other thing about TeamSec is that it cannot only be used to make a new prediction for a protein, but uh, it's modular. So we have those four different steps. The first two are connected because the second uses the scores from the random forest and from most other prediction methods you don't always get scores for each residue in each class so you can't really use them for this. But the third step, which is the neural network that uh, tries to adjust the prediction and the fourth for the topology prediction, in theory you can apply to any other annotation. So for example you could use polyphobias to predict if you somehow trust polyphobias more and then at least see okay what does TMSEC change on the annotation if you run the third and fourth step on it. So the question was can this improve uh, the other methods? Answer is on average yes but as you can see the error bars are already quite high. So this is the difference in the QOK and the QTOP compared to the uh, original prediction from those methods and well for MEMSAT3 which uh, is one of the less performant prediction methods on the transmembrane uh, helices there we have quite a good improvement. Surprisingly for the baseline it didn't work that well on the transmembrane helices so which is the QOK and for polyphobias and MEMSAT SVM, on average, it didn't change anything in the score. But uh, we've seen that TMSEC is quite good on the topology prediction, and there, for all of the methods, we have at least a small improvement, or in the case of the baseline and the MEMSAT uh, SVM, we have quite a large improvement. And there, it's also far enough uh, from zero that we can say, okay, it's a significant improvement. 
This is on those 12 new proteins, right? Uh, no, this is uh, on the 41 transmembrane proteins from the blind uh, test data set. Okay, now we have our methods. We evaluated uh, TMSEC. We have it published. What could we do in the future? Well, one thing is uh, there are uh, those uh, things called reentrant uh, regions. I think you heard about them last lecture. So basically, those are just loops or uh, small helices which go into the membrane but come out of uh, the membrane on the same side, so they don't really cross it. Uh, TMSEC doesn't predict them, and for the training, we consider uh, those as solvable segments. This is just, uh, so we don't consider them as transmembrane, even if they are hydrophobic and inside the membrane, because then it might uh, confuse the predictor, we might predict uh, some of those reentrant uh, regions as transmembrane helices and then the topology once again is screwed up because then we think based on the prediction we are crossing the membrane but we really don't and thus the topology prediction is wrong after this segment. Another thing uh, you could try for example based on the current steps in the fourth step for the topology prediction if we have some transmembrane helices which have a low score which maybe are quite short, we could just see if we say, okay, this is no longer transmembrane helix, but now it's a reentrant loop, so basically we consider it a soluble. Uh, does the topology predictor get a, more, uh, a higher, a more confident score for the topology prediction based uh, on leaving out the segment or not? So this could maybe help identify reentrant regions or not. I haven't tried it yet. Okay, so and the last thing is just general for machine learning. Um, most of the time what you want is uh, a training set that is big enough that you can really train your problem and uh, well uh, in the best case your test set is also quite big so you don't have the problem of those high error bars so you can really say okay you are significantly better. Uh, I had the problem of a small data set. Best case you want for example for every three parameter at least 10 samples in your data set so one magnitude more than you have features. Reality unfortunately looks more like this. So the random forest in the first step has, like I said, 452 features. So 452 free parameters. And uh, then we have our different samples. So in this case, samples are residues or windows, basically. We have two, uh, roughly 2,800 signal peptide residues. So this is our smallest class. It's Still, well, almost enough. It's not 10 times more, but at least it's almost, a, well, basically it's a magnitude more, but not that much higher. For transmembrane residues, which are those 10,400, and for the soluble residues, we have enough samples. So for this, we are, well, quite confident that it's good for the training. Second step, uh, no, third step for the neural network, we have 47 features, which would look uh, good in comparison to the 2,100 samples, but unfortunately we have 25 hidden units, so we would have to multiply those 47 features by those 25 hidden units, and then we only have a factor of roughly two. So we have maybe twice the samples that we have three parameters. And well, the worst case is for the topology prediction, there we have 86 features, but, well, we only have 40 samples in each training split. So there, unfortunately, we have less samples than we have features, but uh, I guess that's also one of the reasons why the random forests perform quite good, because random forests are quite well suited to not overtrain. So even of in this imbalance between samples and features, 
it still managed to, well, not overtrain and give a good prediction, as we've seen in the topology prediction of the method. So, does everybody understand what the problem is in this relation? Yes? Uh, I'm just curious what the parameters of random force. I mean, you have many trees and do you like, count separate values of parameters for every tree in your forest separately or jointly? Uh, so basically, it's uh, every tree uses only a subset of the features. So we have a feature space of uh, 452 for the random forests. And every random forest then for each split, so at each node it selects nine of those features randomly. And out of those nine it tries to get the one feature and the one uh, threshold that best splits the data set. So would the number of parameters of random forest be not nine times the trees? Or let's say... Well, for, yes, so the um, question is if the feature space for the random forest would be nine. Well, for each tree... Not nine, uh, like number of thresholds times the number of trees. I would say these are the parameters, right? Because they are degrees of four. Yeah, well, but the threshold is basically infinite. Or, I mean, it depends on uh, how many decimal numbers you no, no, use no, for I the cutoff. One threshold is one parameter, because you can shift it. Ah, okay. The, uh, um, I'm well, just curious, is it higher than 400 or lower than 400, if you count it like that? I guess if you count it like that, it would be much higher because the tree can really grow up to maybe a height of 30 or 40. You didn't prune, right? No, those random forests are not pruned. So uh, if you count it like that, then the number would probably be much higher. Okay, so last thing about TeamSec, where can you get it? There are three places. Oh, so yeah. One question about the, so last time you said you, you only have 40 samples of training, right? And yes. Now I have to this, yeah. So what do you test it on? How do you validate that your predictions are right? Do you have a cross-validation set or something? Uh, okay, so um, question is, uh, if I have those 40 samples, what do I validate it on? Uh, so in this case, the number of samples is based on one of the four splits of the data set. So at the start I split it into the blind set and uh, the other 75% were split into three different sets that were used for the cross validation. So these numbers of samples are for one of those splits. So the other splits, so my test set, the blind test set for uh, the end validation also has 40 samples uh, where I predict on but it's not used, or uh, to put it correctly, it has uh, more like um, 80 samples to predict on because uh, those 40 samples, it's basically I have 40 positive or inside samples and 40 outside samples. So the number of samples in this case uh, is for the neural network and for the second random forest, it's uh, the minority class. But for those two cases, it's quite balanced, so I only gave one number, only in the for the first random forest, we have quite a dat uh, data set imbalance, and thus I've given all three numbers. Okay. Yeah, so um, if you want to try TeamSec yourself, all you need is PsyBlast, which you have to run for the PSSM, and then TeamSec itself. Uh, you can get it from our Rustlab Debian distribution. You can get it from GitHub. GitHub also includes um, the source code and the code used for training and validation if you want to experiment. And TMSEC is also used in the predict protein web service that we have. So if you want to predict uh, transmembrane proteins, those three sources you can use to predict with TMSEC. Okay, then thanks for your attention.